Good afternoon, folks. I think we should go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is presented by the North Carolina Commission on Racial and Ethnic Disparities, NCCRED, for which I serve as Executive Director. My name is Stephen Rayburn, and thanks for joining us. The uh, title of today's webinar is Balancing the Scales, the Injustice of Confederate Monuments in Public Spaces. And I think you will agree that we have assembled an impressive panel of experts, each with a unique perspective on this topic. And I uh, appreciate the, everyone's willingness to share their time and expertise with us today. Um, among our panelists is Judge Susan Maven from New Jersey. Judge Maven acts as president and moderator of the National Consortium on Racial and Ethnic Fairness in the Courts, which NCCRED is a member. And my boss, NCCRED's co-founder and board chair, James Williams, speaks very highly of Judge Maven and her great work on the consortium. And he asked me specifically to uh, make sure she knew we were honored and pleased to have her join us today. It's All a pleasure. So, um, our moderator today is April Dawson. April will introduce the panel in just a moment, but uh, first a couple of quick reminders. I want to acknowledge that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website in the next few days. And our website address is nccred.org. That's nccred.org. Um, I'd like to encourage everyone to visit our, our website to learn more about us and our work and to keep apprised of future events. Um, you can also find a recording of the webinar we hosted on policing a couple of weeks ago, which was very good, I think. Uh, briefly, for those who may not be familiar with us, NCCRED is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization comprised of over 30 criminal justice stakeholders from throughout the state, including judges, public defenders, police chiefs, district attorneys, scholars, legislators, and advocates, all committed to identifying, documenting, and reducing racial disparities in our criminal justice system. The removal of Confederate monuments outside courthouses and other public spaces is something NCCRED has been advocating for years. We are encouraged by the number of monuments throughout our state that are now coming down. Some toppled by demonstrators, others the result of decisions by those in position of authority. You may have heard the news from earlier this week that the statue of former North Carolina Chief Justice Thomas Ruffin a slave owner was removed from the Court of Appeals building in Raleigh, which is something we've been actively calling for for some time. Thomas Ruff Ruffin wasn't just a slave owner, he was a notoriously cruel slave owner. And as Chief Justice, his ruling in the 1829 NC versus Mann case is considered one of the most brutal in the entire law of American slavery. Um, his statue has come down, but as of this moment, his life-size portrait still looms above the bench, front and center in the North Carolina Supreme Court. And uh, we think it's time for the portrait to come down too, as well as other such tributes to the state's racist and violent past, and we'll keep pushing for that to happen. Um, you'll receive an email through Zoom from me within the next few days asking for feedback on the webinar. And I would appreciate it if you would take a few minutes to respond. I'll be very interested to get your feedback, including suggestions for future webinar topics. Finally, you'll notice on your screens a chat button where you can ask questions. Feel free to do so throughout the webinar, either for a specific panelist or the panel as a whole. April and I will be fielding those and we'll get to as many as time permits. As I mentioned, April Dawson is our moderator today. Ms. Dawson is a professor of law and associate dean of academic affairs at North Carolina Central University School of Law here in Durham. April has taught at the law school for about 15 years and teaches constitutional law, a Supreme Court seminar, um, and voting rights, among other courses. She also co-hosts the Legal Eagle uh, Review radio show, which airs every Sunday evening on WNCU 90.7 FM and is available as a podcast on iTunes. And it's a really great program, April, by the way. So, April. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you everyone for taking your time to attend this wonderful webinar of this incredibly important topic, Balancing the Scales, the Injustice of Confederate Monuments in Public Spaces. We have four wonderful presenters this afternoon. 
And the format of the program is I'm going to give a brief introduction to our first presenter and then they will share some opening comments. I'll ask a few follow up questions and then I'll introduce the next panelist who will give their comments and I will ask some follow up questions. And we'll do that until we've gone through all of the panelists. And then afterwards, we'll open it up to Q&A. As Steve mentioned, you can ask questions in the chat box. Um, and if we have time, we'll have a closing round of comment from presenters. You don't have to wait until the Q&A round to ask your questions. You can go ahead and do that. And Stephen and I, as he mentioned, will be taking a look at those if there are relevant questions during the time that the presenter is giving their opening comments, happy to answer or ask those questions of them as well. So let's go ahead and jump into it. We've got a lot to discuss. And so the first presenter is William Sturkey. He is a professor and historian of modern America at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He specializes in the history of race in the American South with a particular interest in the histories of working class racial minorities. He teaches courses on modern American history, social history or Southern history and the civil rights movement and the history of America in the 1960s. His first book, To Write in the Light of Freedom, is a co-edited collection of newspapers, essays, and poems produced by African American Freedom School students during the Mississippi Freedom Summer of 1964. And his second book, Hattiesburg, An American City in Black and White, is a biracial history of the Southern Jim Crow. Dr. Sturkey regularly gives public lectures and appears in local and national media. Dr. Sturkey, thank you so much for joining us. And we're gonna have you share your thoughts on the historical analysis and scholarly perspective of these Confederate monuments. What do we need to understand as we have a deeper discussion into these monuments on or in public spaces? Okay, great. Thank you all so much for having me and thanks to everybody um, for organizing this panel, especially James Williams and Stephen Rayburn. And uh, thanks to everybody in the audience and for, um, for your audience today, but also your attention to these important matters in general. I think that, um, so I'm just gonna offer a few comments about the historical context of the Confederate monument. So I'm happy to answer any questions, of course. I look forward to our discussion. I think by now, a lot of people know the basic gist about many of our Confederate monuments. So many of them were erected between 1890 and 1910, decades and decades after the end of the Civil War. And in this era, these Confederate monuments were not put in cemeteries, but rather in prominent public places. In many cases, the most prominent public place in a town, um, the courthouse or the city hall. And of course, many of these were erected by an organization known as the United Daughters of the Confederacy, or the UDC, as I'll call them. So of course, many of you know this by now, I'll just offer some basics about that context in American history. So the years 1890 to 1910 are really essential here. These are the years when um, white people across the South constructed Jim Crow. So of course we have the Civil War, which ends slavery. We have Reconstruction, which lasts until 1877. That's when we get the 14th and the 15th Amendments. But then of course we get this peeling back of black rights. Um, it starts in places like Louisiana and Mississippi, which, which engage in violence to overthrow um, duly elected African-American legislat legislatures. And then, of course, it starts to spread throughout the South. We see violence in different places, including Wilmington, North Carolina. And that violence is always followed by constitutional changes in which states begin to disfranchise African-Americans, largely through poll taxes and literacy test tests that get rid of basically black people's right to vote. This of course is what the civil rights movement fights against in the 1950s and 1960s. But it's this era, 1890 to 1910, when every single Southern state changes their constitution in order to get around the 15th amendment and disfranchise African-Americans. And so often the people who were involved in erecting the Confederate monuments at the same exact time they were also these activist leaders who were promoting white supremacy and crafting the Jim Crow system. 
So that's essential to understand. This is the context in which most of these things go up, this exact same moment. So of course, the UDC is founded in 1894, after the Civil War, after the end of Reconstruction, right in the middle of this era. And so much of what people think of as Southern history is shaped by the UDC. And they have this broader educational mission across the South. As they're disfranchising African Americans, they're also working to commemorate the Civil War and the Confederate cause. So what do they do? They're very, very active. Um, they seek to reshape the reasons behind the war. They argue over and over and over again that slavery was not the central cause of the war, that the Confederacy was in the right. Um, they promote white supremacy quite plainly. They promote the morality of slavery, even as they argue that it was not the fundamental cause of the Civil War. They argue that Black people should not be allowed to vote. They argue that Reconstruction was a horrible process and that the, the great tragedy in Southern history was not necessarily slavery, but actually Reconstruction itself. They promoted the Ku Klux Klan. 1913, the UDC published a book that was all about the Klan, quite openly promoted the Ku Klux Klan and celebrated its role during Reconstruction. Um, these, the, the women who were involved, they went into schools to sponsor essay contests and promote a neo-Confederate education. They also sponsored plays in which white people would dress in blackface to glorify the system of slavery and celebrate their role as slaves. You see this all over Southern society in the 1890s and the early 1900s. Their historical method, of course, is just riddled with problems. Do they ever use the voices of African Americans? No. Do they ever look at primary sources from the 1860s to discuss the reasons for the war? No. Um, do they look at Klan testimonies in the 1870s when they're researching and promoting the Klan? Of course not. So in many of the, the state ordinances of secession, the states in the 1860s say very plainly, look, the reason we're going to war is over slavery. Yet here we were 30 to 40 years later, this organization denied that slavery was the primary reason. These people were activists. They had a pre-existing agenda that shaped their historical conclusions. They were not working with evidence, but rather they were working to meet that pre-existing agenda. And one of the things that's very frustrating about the discussions that we're having today is many people suggest that today's historians are somehow biased or political without ever realizing how biased and political the people were that put up the monuments in the first place. A lot of people act as if these monuments were just dropped into place by the ghosts of Robert E. Lee sometime in the 1860s or 1870s, but that is far from true. Um, we're talking about decades and decades after the end of the war. And the greatest argument, I think, against the monuments is actually that they never should have been put there in the first place. They were not erected by a democratic process, nor were they erected by good faith historical interpreters. And a couple of really interesting things begin to happen when you look closely at some of the monuments. And I'll unpack a few of those. One is that, again, if, if you look at who erected them, not just the UDC, but even if you look at individual actors, we see time and time again, they often actually come from these really elite families who actually did own enslaved humans before the Civil War. Yet it was these very same people who insist that slavery had nothing to do with the war and that the monuments were needed just to honor the poor white troops who gave their lives to defending the Confederacy. Of course, if they really cared about the poor white troops, then they wouldn't have marched them off to die in the first place. But what the monuments were doing when they were erected, as Jim Crow is being crafted, is they served to divide poor white and poor black political actors. And it's one way that they use this cudgel of race, right, in order to make sure that people with similar economic interests don't get together and try and vote. In Wilmington, North Carolina, there was a brief fusion movement in which poor whites and poor blacks aligned politically. Well, then came the violence, then came the Confederate monuments, and all of a sudden, the poor whites and the poor blacks are separate. And so in, in making sure that these races remain divided, um, these leaders embraced this sort of lost cause message. That's one of the functions that the statues always had. And it's incredibly ironic that they still have that function today to divide poor whites and poor blacks based on this cudgel of race. The other thing that happens if you look closely at the monuments, you start to look at the dedication speeches. When the monuments went up, what did people say? 
And we have all these examples, when you look close at these dedication speeches, of people not only talking about the Civil War and the Confederacy, but all, all of a sudden you start to hear they're, they're talking about the Ku Klux Klan. They're talking about Reconstruction. They talk about the 14th Amendment at the monument dedication speeches all the time. And they often also talk about white or Anglo-Saxon supremacy. They talked about all of these things constantly at the dedication speeches, which give us clues today about the intended meanings behind these monuments. As far as the monuments themselves, I think first of all, it's important to, to recognize that there's a major distinction between a monument and a memorial. A lot of people wanna conflate the two, okay? They act as if there are bodies buried in the ground. But these monuments are abstract ideals to the dead, okay? Memorials to dead people might appear in many places, but they most often appear in cemeteries. Monuments are honorifics. They often appear in places of prominence, like courthouses or city squares. And the people that want to conflate the two often overlook one important detail. There are no bodies in the ground at the site of most of these Confederate monuments. They are just an ideal, right? The graves are elsewhere, that, and they actually have headstones and memorials in the cemeteries. But it's, it's this. This is important to also realize why you get so many Confederate monuments in places that were founded after the end of the Civil War, in places like Durham, North Carolina, or Birmingham, Alabama, or Hattiesburg, Mississippi, places that didn't even exist in 1861. No one ever left those cities to go fight in the Civil War. They didn't even exist. But all of those cities have or did have, or did, or did have Confederate monuments. Those monuments are meant to honor a cause, not just people. The second important thing about the monuments themselves, I think, is they make you look up, okay? And this is key. They're not necessarily designed as a point of reflection, but rather something that draws your eye up, saying, this is what we honor. This is who we are. Look up to this, right? This is what we aspire to. Of all the things in our history, in hundreds of years of history, that we could share, it is this fight, that fight in the Civil War to create a white slaveholding ethno state that our society values the most. Look up to it before you enter the courthouse. And then, of course, finally, they put them at the courthouse because that is where the most consequential decisions in our society are made. And that is the one place where Black people have no equal access. They are symbols of power and intimidation. That was where Jim Crow laws were made, where they were upheld, where Black people's freedoms were denied, and where the state acted most forcefully to ensure racial discrimination. The other thing I want to say, the final thing I want to say about the historical context here is about Black resistance. Confederate monuments are not something that Black people just started to notice in 2015. We've always seen them, and Black folks have always had a wide range of interpretations as to their meaning. But Black people have always protested Confederate monuments. There are many examples of this. Um, John Lewis, in his 1988 memoir, talked about the Confederate monument in his hometown of Troy, Alabama, 1988. The Chicago Defender, which covered race news from the South for decades and decades and decades, talked about Confederate monuments in the 1910s and the 1920s all the time. There were tons of stories about how awful these Confederate monuments were. Um, in Charleston, this is not a Confederate monument, but related, in Charleston, a Black woman born in, in 1888 said this about the, Cal about the Calhoun statue that was recently removed, and I quote, I believe white people were talking to us about Jim Crow through that statue. And in Chatham County, North Carolina, I, I did a talk there a few months ago, and we looked up some newspaper coverage about that particular monument before we went and gave the talk. That monument in Chatham County was erected in Pittsburgh in 1907. And one of the newspaper articles we found came from the following week in which somebody covered the face of the monument in black shoe polish. An African-American, we think, covered that monument in 1907 in black shoe polish within 10 days of it going up, responding to what that African-American person thought the monument meant in 1907. So these protests are nothing new. So I just wanted to offer a broad historical context for the monuments, and I'll go ahead and close there for the next panelist. I look forward to um, engaging in, in our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Sturkey. That was really helpful in providing that historical context. Before we move on to Attorney Davenport, um, just a couple of questions. 
Um, so you mentioned uh, that these monuments were designed to divide because you had during the late 1800s um, some fusion movements where you had uh, African Americans, those that were formerly enslaved, joining forces with um, uh, white folks who were in, who had the interests of some of the same, had some of the same concerns, like concerns about uh, having a fair wage, uh, education, and you had these fusion movements that allowed for African Americans to actually serve in the local governments. Uh, can you also talk about how? And you talked a little bit about the placement of the monuments in front of courts is used to intimidate, but can you talk a little bit about the timing in which the, the monuments, these Confederate monuments were, were put up uh, and how that oftentimes coincided with um, efforts to uh, address issues of inequality and how the placement of these monuments, the increasing um, positions of the monuments were used to intimidate Black folk who were trying to challenge the status quo. Sure, I think that, so with, I mean, as I was saying, many people were being disfranchised during these same exact years. And Jim Crow sort of settled in everywhere in a little bit of a different way, and, and, a little, and the timing was a little bit different. But for many of them, it was either at the back end or right in the middle of these moments when Black people could still vote. The great question in Southern politics it, that still lingers today is what would happen if black and white poor voters got together and started to vote together? That would be an unstoppable wave. And the people that put up the Confederate monuments were very often elite white Southerners who were concerned over black people voting, yeah, but then also white people voting along with black people because of that great concern then they would be compromised in their, in their status in society. And that still holds true today. And so a lot of these people wanted to make sure they were driving race as hard as they possibly could to make sure that race was the fundamental political issue, to make people afraid of African-Americans, of, of the potential of black violence, to inflame you know, lynching crowds. Of course, lynchings were very prevalent along, among this time too. And so I think that is really one of the keys that many people don't look at. The Confederate monuments weren't just there as a lesson to black people, they were there as a lesson for many white people as well. And one of the most striking things I think that we should just, let's just call a spade a spade, is the Confederate monument issue in the year 2020 is an incredibly convenient issue for elite Southerners who don't want poor whites thinking about healthcare and education and Medicaid expansion they want them to be single issue Confederate monument voters so that they're still not voting with poor black people today. All right, thank you for that. And, and the last question I have for you is, you mentioned that there's a difference between a monument and a memorial. And when we think about all of these Confederate statues, um, they were all or many of them were manufactured in from the same places. And so when you think about a memorial um, focusing on particular individuals, a lot of these monuments are of the same identical type using, you know, coming from the same cast. Can you talk about how um, that plays a role in how we should view these monuments as monuments as opposed to memorials? Yeah, I mean, look, a lot of them are pieces of crap, honestly. The one in Durham, they pulled it down and it just kind of thumped together and it kind of crumpled, you know. It came down pretty easily and then the thing was just, you know, it just dropped and it was broken. But I mean, yeah, they're, they're, a lot of them are pretty cheap. You know, these folks, a lot of them didn't have a lot of money. They used taxpayer dollars to erect some of these. A couple of them are, are pretty fancy, but many of them really are not. And um, the only reverence that they really hold is where they were positioned, you know, high up in front of the courthouse. But many of them really, if you think about it, they don't really mean all that much because they just symbolize this abstract idea to these soldiers. But at the same time, the soldiers have headstones and memorials and cemeteries already. You know, it's not as if people go to these things to, to say a prayer or to lay a wreath, you know? They're just these sort of cheap symbols in many places that held high off the ground just to help people you know honor this lost cause but if you can get your head around that they're that they don't actually need to represent 
people who were who were killed they don't have to mean all that much the only meaning again that they have is just where they were positioned i think that's exactly what they were shooting for all right thank you for that so our next presenter is matt davenport he is a criminal defense attorney in greenville north carolina he worked for five years as a Pitt County prosecutor for, before opening his private practice in 2005. His first book, First Over There, was published in 2015, and it was a finalist for the Guggenheim Prize in Military History. His articles have been published in the Wall Street Journal, and he has presented at the New York Historical Society and on C-SPAN's 2 Book TV. Attorney Davin Part has taught criminal law at East Carolina University for four years and is currently working on his second book while still practicing criminal defense full time. Attorney Davin Port, thank you for uh, being here and giving of your time. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you and you can share your experience, particularly in Pitt County and uh, the decision, the recent decision to move Confederate monuments from there. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And uh, that's really difficult to follow Professor Sturkey. <laughs> um, uh, he, he gave such a great historic overview. I'll just tell you my perspective singularly from Pitt County and then what I, what I sought to learn statewide in my research on the monuments. Um, in, I have walked under the shadow of the Pitt County Confederate Soldiers Monument, as Professor Sturkey said, that's what's at courthouse grounds of these monuments, for 20 years. And the first 15 or so, I'm almost ashamed to say, easy for me to not even really notice. Um, I started listening to my colleagues, uh, especially um, African American colleagues, friends, neighbors, clients, and uh, I started listening more and more about what it meant to them and uh, started to consider that here in a central place of honor between the American and North Carolina flags at our courthouse in the centerpiece of our courthouse lawn is this monument that you do look up to supposedly with reverence and you have to walk three blocks away to see any type of monument or memorial to any American soldiers from any of the other wars. And uh, on the front of this monument is the, the Confederate flag. Uh, it says to our Confederate heroes, compared to many of the others, fairly innocuous, but still, I wanted to know more where it fit in our state's history. I saw that it was dedicated in 1914, started wondering what, what does that mean? Um, when I started looking through the resources of um, the North Carolina Government Her uh, Heritage Library and uh, publications from the UNC Library, I started mapping out, uh, starting in 1868, the very first war memorial, Civil War memorial, Confederate uh, memorial, um, all the way through 2011, the most recent, um, about 140 of them. I found uh, 52 placed at courthouses. Uh, most of them were Confederate soldiers' monuments. Um, and most said had on them different phrases. I then wanted to look at when were these dedicated. I found it interesting in the 27 years following the Civil War, the end of the Civil War, there were only six Confederate monuments erected. They were actually memorials and cemeteries, as Professor Sturkey said, big difference. Uh, it wasn't until 1892, and as he said, this is the beginning of our General Assembly's push for Jim Crow. Of course, we know the first Jim Crow laws uh, date after the election of uh, President Hayes and the withdrawal of federal troops from the South, the end of Reconstruction. Uh, you go back to the beginning of segregation of railroads in the early 1880s. North Carolina starts, uh, North Carolina General Assembly starts pushing Jim Crow laws in 1891 and two. We get our first one on the courthouse lawn in 1892. And then uh, we get what Professor Strickey already uh, referenced, um, our own disenfranchised amendment, 1898 to 2000, I mean, I'm sorry, 1898 to 1900, um, our state passes disenfranchised amendment with a poll tax literacy test and the grandfather clause, of course, to exclude to, uh, um, so that illiterate whites would still be able to vote under the literacy um, requirement. And um, you see that being fought in the courts, 1901, 1902, three, four, being each of those provisions being upheld and you see more Jim Crow laws being passed. And then you see these local 
uh, segregation uh, racial zoning ordinances uh, that local towns begin passing in 1909, 1910. Uh, our General Assembly tries to pass a, in 1912, tries to pass a statewide uh, uh, racial zoning law for rural areas. Uh, local towns, Winston-Salem, Morrisville passed theirs in 1910. Greenville here, 1913, we passed a racial zoning law uh, restricting black citizens and residents to certain areas of Greenville. Uh, Asheville passed it the same year. It's no coincidence that the very next year we get our Confederate War monument on our courthouse lawn. What's interesting about those years, 1905 to 1915, I found that half 25, half of the monuments that went up on courthouse lawns were erected between 1905 and 1915. There were 30 Confederate monuments erected in North Carolina over that 10 years and 25 at courthouses, almost half the state's total, and it's not coincidental. Um, and then seeing that taper off where you don't see many, and, and we've seen this on the national scale, when you see these graphs of when they were uh, dedicated, when they were placed, uh, then again, we go almost, almost 30 years without a uh, monument being placed at the courthouse, and then Brown versus Board of Education happens, uh, desegregation begins, and we see in 1957, 1959, 1960, they start going up at courthouses again. That's not coincidental. Uh, the worst one, in my opinion, for revisionism in the state went up in Taylorsville, the Confederate Soldiers Monument at Alexander County Courthouse, quote, not for the preservation of slavery, but for our greatest heritage, the war was fought. Uh, each of the four sides of this obelisk have, rev have rev just a uh, plethora of revisionism. Uh, the, the last side that faces the courthouse says, Lee was opposed to secession and slavery, Grant owned slaves. Um, and, as recently as 2011 uh, in Bakersville, the Mitchell, Mitchell County Confederate Dead Monument commemorated the men, quote, who died for their freedom and independence and not for slavery. Um, as Professor Sturkey said, these are, these were not erected by, as he said, quote, good faith historical interpreters. Um, they are unapologetic monuments to revisionism and they're not history and they're in places of reverence. So I thought locally, what can we do to try to get the Pitt County uh, con uh, Confederate War Monument removed from the courthouse lawn? And I really, we had uh, practically in our county commissioners, we had the votes to be able to do it. I thought it would be important, and I'm not on the county commissioners, but I was researching this to try to share it with them because I knew that many might have been ambivalent somewhere against removing it, but I used to be ambivalent. And I said, if you learn a little bit about this, maybe it'll change their perspective. And I really wanted it to be bipartisan. I thought if it was a, a, a partisan vote here, I thought it, it, it would just not be healthy. I thought it would be very healing to have a, a bipartisan vote to remove it. And I shared everything that I found uh, with different commissioners and met personally with some. Uh, our uh, partisan breakdown of our uh, board of commissioners is six to three, six Democrats, three Republicans. And I really wanted both parties to, to hear and learn. And uh, we ended up with a bipartisan vote of seven to two to remove it and place it in storage. It was actually, it was eight to one to remove it. And uh, the dispute was over whether to put it somewhere specific or place it in storage. So um, I was glad that, that happened and we were able to do that here. Um, but that's the journey I've had with it here locally. Thank you, Attorney Davenport. Um, in in listening to you, sh listening to you share your kind of journey and learning about these Confederate monuments, uh, it it reminds me that there are so many of us who don't know an accurate history that that we don't necessarily get it in in school. Um, and so I wanted to get your thoughts on um, what advice would you give to uh, anyone who may not be um, 
immediately aware of, of any type of history that, that speaks to, or at least informs our understanding of where we are today as a country, where's a good place to start? So you mentioned that you had friends, that you listened to clients, colleagues. Uh, what was your next step after that point? Well, it, it's kind of what I, uh, I've mentioned to a few people since is as an adult, I think there's two roles you should live by one, consider things from other someone else's perspective. If they tell you something's offensive, believe them. Uh, if, if, uh, and second, know that you don't know everything. Uh, I, was, I was brought up in the Midwest and my dad's side of the family's from South Carolina. I have two direct ancestors who fought with the Confederacy. My grandfather, two uncles, my great uncles, they were all members of the Sons of the Confederacy. I grew up with that. So I was taught when I was young, I was given, I was instilled ignorance. I was taught this state's rights myth. I was taught the Southern heritage myth and uh, deprogramming that is difficult. Um, what, what I think, as, as you said, education's the biggest thing, education and empathy. I, I heard someone recently say, if, if a friend of yours, if a black friend of yours says something's racist, why are you gonna argue with them? If, if my son says, I heard him, I'm not gonna say, no, I didn't. If my mom says, what you just said to me offended me, I'm not gonna say, no, I didn't. I'm going to say, okay, you're right, I'm sorry. I need to look at this from your respect, perspective. And uh, some of my, my best friends, my uh, colleagues here, finally opened my eyes to that. And once I saw it and started looking into this, these were what, what one thing that really changed my mind in 2017, Mayor Landrieu of New Orleans gave a great address on the removal of four Confederate monuments from uh, New Orleans, from places of honor in New Orleans. And in his address, he said, remembrance is not reverence. And he said, these were erected purposefully to send a strong message to all who walked in their shadows about who is still in charge in this town. When I see one in a courthouse, I ask myself, what does my friend of color say to their children when they walk into the courthouse and it's supposed to be equal justice under the law and there's a Confederate monument? Can they say this is equal justice under the law? Absolutely not. You can't say that. And neither can I. And so instead of celebrating this, um, you know, fictional sanitized Confederacy, people, we really need to educate our friends and neighbors. This starts locally um, and our children about what the truth really was. And it's time for that to change. And I, and I see that it is changing and I'm glad. Excellent. And, and I think you've answered this question, but one of the questions in the chat was, uh, why do so many people, especially white people, think that these monuments are about Southern heritage? Be and, and I hate to use the overused word of ignorance, but I, it, that's where it comes from. And that's um, because that it is, a, it is like comfort food, like states' rights is comfort food for someone that doesn't want to face a a very immoral past and to face the Holocaust of slavery uh, and face the sin of slavery is you have these comfort foods of life and property and states rights and we all know that that's the sanitized version that's been sold and uh, history is not supposed to be comfort food it's just supposed to be factual. All right, wonderful. So we've got some more questions in the chat, but I'm going to save those. Uh, I'm going to introduce our next panelist, Scott Holmes, who is a colleague of mine at NCCU School of Law. He is a clinical professor and he supervises the Civil Litigation Clinic. He also teaches trial practice, appellate advocacy, criminal procedure, legal problems of the poor, and restorative justice. Professor Holmes' clinic handles civil matters related to prison conditions, fair housing, police misconduct, and evictions. His research and writing focus on how racial inequity impacts the rule of law. He has worked as a trial lawyer and an appellate attorney in civil rights and criminal defense cases, representing a number of people, including anti-racism protesters, who were prosecuted for removal of the Confederate monuments in Durham and Chapel Hill. So Professor Holmes, I'm going to turn the floor over to you.
Thank you. It's such an honor to be with, with all of our, our panelists um, who I've, I, I know about and admire. I'm grateful for Stephen and James Williams to invite me. And of course, I'm delighted, April, that you are, are facilitating our, our discussion because I, I have a great amount of respect for you and your work, and particularly around the Constitution, the First Amendment work. So um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about some of the legal um, aspects of this, um, this Confederate monument situation. Um, my involvement began when I started defending protesters. And so I defended folks who were charged with pulling down the Confederate monument in Durham. Uh, then I, I defended uh, protesters in Chapel Hill, not only folks who were charged with pulling down the monument, but folks who protested at Chapel Hill uh, prior to the removal of that monument. Um, a couple of those cases, some of those cases have been dismissed at trial, a couple are still pending. Um, I've also defended protesters in Pittsburgh when, the, when Pittsburgh was dealing with the controversy around removing its monument. And so uh, some of my learning um, about the legal issues and the history um, are as a result of my criminal defense work. I've also been involved in um, kind of the, some of the civil work around having these cases, these monuments removed um, through the civil process. And so I've worked with uh, folks in, in Pittsburgh to understand the law as it relates to property and license and gift to try to help understand how the history of that monument allowed the city, the county commissioners in the city to remove it without violating the North Carolina Heritage Act, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, I also worked with folks to um, uh, undo the deal that UNC uh, tried to make with the Sons of the Confederacy in which they were gonna not only find a way to give them the Confederate monument, but also $2.5 million to take it. And that civil work um, also uh, gave me an opportunity to not only learn the history, but litigate the history around that monument. Um, and I've also, in conjunction with all of that work, developed kind of a legal theory around how these monuments violate our constitution. They, const they are government speech that violates our equal protection clause. And um, finally, more recently, um, we're finding that uh, local um, municipalities and counties are uh, restricting courthouse access to prevent protests of their monuments. And so lately I've been engaged with a legal team to make sure that uh, traditional public forums like courthouses and courthouses steps are open to folks who want to protest these monuments and have been involved in the litigation here in, Gra in, in Graham, North Carolina here. So I've had a kind of a, a variety of ways that in which I've approached the, the law of this situation. Um, and, but they're all connected by the idea of the Confederate monuments. So, one of the get one of the real fun parts of doing this legal work is that I've got to learn a lot of history and I've got to litigate a lot of history. And so for this lost cause narrative that both Professor Sturkey and Mr. Davenport have, have identified in which the United Daughters of the Confederacy really engaged in a successful propaganda effort, both with the monuments and with the revisionist history and school books and schools to create uh, a, a, a history that supports a theory of, of white supremacy, that history helps me as a lawyer to show discriminatory intent. So when I want to argue that these monuments are government speech, they aren't memorials as we've heard, but from a legal matter, a monument in front of a courthouse is government speech. Then I get to say, well, if the government is speaking, are there any constitutional restraints on that speech? And if it had been, if it were religious speech, there would be a lot of establishment clause law that would help us analyze why the government should or should not be engaging in religious speech. Well, what I've learned and what I've researched in, in, in the context of the Confederate monument is that Similarly, we ought to have the same kind of legal infrastructure to analyze government racist speech, that the same way that the government should not endorse religion in its speech or coerce people in their behavior with religious speech. Similarly, the government should not be able to engage in racist speech that, that violates the Equal Protection Clause. If there is a discriminatory intent 
that is clearly behind the government speech, then that should violate our Equal Protection Clause the same way religious speech violates our Establishment Clause. So I've had an opportunity to learn the history and litigate that theory in both criminal defense situations and um, in our arguments in the civil cases that what's going on here, the history is relevant as a legal matter to show the intended meaning of this government speech is clearly racist and therefore it's, it, the, it's, it's legally correct, if not also historically correct, that these monuments have no place in our, um, in our public squares. So some of the ways in which those legal theories have played out um, as a factual matter, um, the, the history with respect to um, the, the criminal defense cases, um, the, the monument in Durham that was pulled down, the monument in Chapel Hill, it first was um, a person, Maya Little, was charged with vandalizing that by putting on some red paint mixed with blood. Um, and then later it was pulled down and, and defending those cases, part of our argument was to create a historical record that showed the court that these monuments were uh, government hate speech and should not be there in the first place. And it was necessary to either contextualize or remove them um, because they uh, posed a harm to the, an immediate harm to the, um, to the public, to, the, to, to people. Um, in the civil aspect, in the civil cases, um, uh, the, the one important law to know about is um, shortly after Dylan Roof killed the folks at the AME church in um, South Carolina, that launched uh, a revival of the, the long historical controversy around Confederate symbols. And some folks, some states started thinking about removing Confederate symbols. And as a result of that, many states passed what they called heritage acts, protecting monuments from being removed by local cities and counties. And in North Carolina, that law is section 100-2.1, which creates, makes it hard to remove these Confederate monuments at the state and local, at the local municipality and county level. Um, and so one of the challenges in bringing civil actions to remove these is this law. Well, um, when in, in Pittsburgh, for example, we found historically that it, it appeared to be that the county commissioners, when they allowed that monument to go up, granted a license to the Daughters of the Confederacy to put that monument up. And in the law, a license is not, um, is, can be revoked by the person who grants a license. So it doesn't vest a long-term property interest in putting something at that place. So as a, what the, as a legal matter, what happened in Pittsburgh was that the, the county just revoked their license and said, you know, Daughters of Confederacy, come get your monument. And when they didn't come get their monument, they removed it. Um, another thing that happened there and that happened also in, in a similar thing happened in Winston-Salem. There, the legal issue was slightly different. The property on which the, the, had been public property, but had been transferred to a nonprofit. And so now that the property wasn't owned by the state, the Heritage Act didn't apply, and, and, and Winston-Salem could get rid of it in the same kind of legal theory. We don't own it, so we can, you, we can have you, you know, come take it away. In each of those cases, the Daughters of the Confederacy hired lawyers to challenge that under the Heritage Act, and they failed to even show standing under that act to have something to prevent the removal, um, that, that one of the things you have to do to have a legal suit is to have standing under the law, and they couldn't show that they were the kind of party um, that would have standing and that this particular statute provided for private standing at all. So that's another common thread in, in litigation around trying to get these things removed. In states and counties where it's clearly on county property, this statute um, 100 2.1 does seem to pose a difficulty for the removal of these monuments. But up until the killing of George Floyd and the protests around that, many uh, in UNC, uh, for example, the Board of Governors would say that their interpretation of 100 2.1 that has a public safety exception, but their, their interpretation of that section of the law is very narrow. 
And their, their idea of public safety is it's gonna fall down and the building inspector is gonna say this thing's an immediate physical threat. But other folks like the governor, our, our governor, and uh, other leaders at UNC, well, public safety can also mean violence around the monument. And um, well, the, the idea that that, pub, that interpretation of the public safety portion of the Heritage Act um, has only taken on real meaning here lately. And as you see the monuments kind of coming down in Raleigh um, and the Ruffin uh, statute that we were talking about, those are being removed pursuant to that public safety um, provision that had been narrowly and construed. And now in light of our new political um, uh, atmosphere, folks are much more inclined to interpret that more broadly. Um, a final, a final thing that I'd like to, to, to note in terms of an, an interesting thing to me about litigating these issues, um, either in criminal and civil court, um, a couple of interesting observations. One is that as a, as a trial lawyer, it, and also someone who's deeply interested in history, I, I studied history um, at, um, you know, as, a, as, a, as my major and background in history. Um, it's, a real, it's a real gift to get to use the tools of the court, that, you know, depositions, testimony under oath, cross-examination, um, and litigate these historical facts. And, and it's one thing for folks to stand out in front of a courthouse and, 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 and promote and say a lost cause narrative that has no basis in fact. It's a whole nother thing to get these people under oath on the stand and make them actually prove it, that the, this lost cause narrative is true. And it's such a joy to watch how it just kind of melts and crumbles before your face. And a good example of that was the, the UNC's attempt to give $2.5 million to the Confederates, that what they did was they took a series of letters from President Venable and the Daughters of Confederacy, and they did a contorted historical reading that somehow these letters created an agency relationship in which they intended to convey the, the monument to the daughters so that they were their actual owners. And then from these letters, they concocted some kind of gift condition subsequent, which is a legal term for it. We're going to give it to you, but if you ever try to take it down, it reverts back to us and it's ours again. They concocted this bizarre factual historical record to try to fit it within this 100-2.1 to create an exception for private ownership when the history was that no, the daughters never owned it. The, the UNC collected some money from the daughters, but mainly from alumni and put in some of their own money and it, and, and it was a UNC monument, so it didn't fit within that exception. And so they couldn't just give it back to the daughters who then gave it to the sons and give them all $2.5 million. That, that was historically wrong. And it didn't take much of a historical record to show it was wrong. Well, the fact, and they had to misapply the law. They had to misapply the law of gifts of conditions subsequent. They also had to misapply the law of what women were able to do at the time in terms of contracting, because they, they, their theory was that the women, that President Venable was acting as their agent because as women, they couldn't engage in contracts. So under the, the, the UNC's theory, because the daughters couldn't engage in contract, Venable was acting on their behalf to get them the monument, which then they gave back to the university, which is a contorted theory to begin with. But what they missed was as a historical fact, only their husbands, could sign off on it to make their contracts legal, but he couldn't act as their agent, even if he wanted to, because the old doctrine of coverture and how women were disabled as being able to contract as, as a matter of patriarchy, they misinterpreted their own um, sexist law to try to create a, a legal exception that get the Confederates their monument back. And what I learned what I, as a litigator and as, a, as someone who's interested in history, they repeated the same um, rhetorical and historical um, fabrications that the daughters did when they created the lost cause narrative. That the, 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 that the daughters of the Confederacy created this lost cause narrative that tried to explain how the South was actually heroic, that actually slavery wasn't so bad, and white supremacy was great, and that the power and the money should go toward the white folks. They successfully did that. And then at the same time, they contorted the law. They, they, were, they were violating the 14th Amendment then um, when they said people can be treated equal, unequally. And they contorted the law 
of, of property and contracts, and they supported a whole Jim Crow regime that was not, not well grounded in our, the constitutional structure that was created by the Reconstruction. Well, in their lawsuit, UNC, when they tried to give the money back to give the money to the Confederates, the 2.5 million and the monument, their complaint has the same defects. They misinterpreted the facts, they, they contorted the history, and they completely violated the law. Um, and it shows again to me how, how even now, after our effort to try to name the correct history and be legally accurate, when what's at stake is white supremacy, even smart lawyers at Wamba Carlisle will try to use the same kind of techniques that worked for white supremacy before to try to make it work again. And so I think it's a, that's a good place for me to stop. I'll be glad to talk about any of those aspects because I've thrown out a, quite a variety of different legal issues that arise in these cases. Thank you, Professor Holmes. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's wonderful. And I, I always enjoy hearing you speak about your, um, you know, on the ground advocacy and you demonstrate creative lawyering. So you're not willing to, you know, just, um, accept arguments that have previously been made. You look at the law and figure out how you can use it to further, uh, further justice. Um, when you were talking about, you know, the government hate speech, that's a novel argument, uh, the Heritage Act, and there were some questions, and I think you answered some of the questions that were in the chat about that, but in terms of the breadth of the language and how we interpret that. Um, James Williams has a, a question kind of along the same lines of what I was thinking about as you were speaking, but he expresses it a little bit more eloquently. Uh, he notes that under the preamble of the North Carolina Rules of Professional Responsibility, lawyers should seek to improve the administration of justice. Do we have a duty to try to get these monuments removed? So do, do lawyers have an affirmative duty to do what in fact you're, you're, you are doing? Um, well, I, I want to jump on that bandwagon and say yes. Um, we also have a duty to do pro bono work. Um, and I think that uh, my colleagues who aren't doing a lot of pro bono work and who also aren't trying to, you know, remove these and it, for the purpose of increasing the, the ability to us to administer justice, you know, I would encourage them to kind of examine how, how you know, they spend their time and what they're thinking about. But it reminds me, I, I happened to be in another, another case that was completely unrelated to any of this um, in, in front of a superior court judge in chambers because I don't wear a tie when I go to court. So when I get in front of a new judge, I meet with them in advance to kind of explain why my Quaker values don't let me wear a tie. And for some reason, this judge needed to tell me a story about how when he was in charge of handling jury summons in his, in his, his county, and he would get written exceptions what, why folks didn't want to come do jury duty. He told me the story about how he received one from a potential juror who was black who explained that they cannot walk into the courthouse, that it, there's a Confederate soldier standing out in there, outside that courthouse. And, there's, and there, the only thing that that represents is the treasonous defense of racialized human slavery. And there's no way that person can seek, participate in what is equal justice with that thing standing out front. And they're traumatized by having to walk by it. So please don't make me come serve as a jury, juror. And the, the judge told me that story and how he let that person off. Well, I'm thinking as a criminal defense attorney, that's the person I need on my jury. So, you know, yes, I please honor these folks, you know, their, their, their needs and their desires, but we, we, we need you down at the courthouse. So yes, to administer justice, we need to not have government racist speech standing out front holding a gun um, so that we can have a, a better access to our, our courts and our courts can actually deliver on this promise of equal protection under the law. Great, thank you for that. All right, so I'm gonna introduce our next panelist, Judge Susan Maven, who is all the way with us from New Jersey. So thank you, Judge. Um, she is a New Jersey Superior Court judge and she's been so since 2001. She has presided over cases in the Family and Criminal Divisions and served in the Appellate Division. She is an ardent proponent of diversity and equality initiatives for the court system. 
She was appointed to the New Jersey Supreme Court Committee on Minority Affairs in 2004 and is the first and only woman to serve as chairman of that committee in its 35 year plus history. She is currently serving um, a second term as the president moderator of the National Consortium on Racial and Ethnic Fairness in the Courts. Judge Maven, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you. It's certainly an honor to travel so far to North Carolina to be with all of you today. And for those of uh, you who are from around the country, um, it's an honor to be on this panel. And before I get into my formal speech, uh, my presentation, I just wanted to reflect as I'm listening to all this wonderful history, um, you, know, you never quite know how life brings you full circle sometimes and puts you in a place where you perhaps ought to be. And what I find brings me to this place, it takes me back to my childhood. I grew up on Long Island, New York, in a very uh, mixed community. I dare say it was probably predominantly white. And when I tell this, my background story, I say if there were ever uh, any other uh, black uh, kids in the school, it was probably one of my siblings. That's, that's how um, lack of diversity it was. But at any rate, um, growing up in that environment, um, we did well. We did very well scholastically in school. We moved along. Uh, I'm the fourth of five children in my family. So my two older sisters went away to college. My brother went to military. Now it's my time. And so I followed my sister and went from Long Island, New York, and went to Philadelphia to University of Pennsylvania. And when I got there, um, I already had in my mind I was going to be a lawyer already had in my mind my long-term goal of being a judge. But I knew I had to do this college thing first. And so I did what many of us did, but I would major in political science. So I started along that course until I had a very um, insightful professor who said, you know, Susan, you don't have to major in poli-sci. You can major in whatever you want to go to law school. You know, so think about that. And I did. And being on that campus and being in that environment and being involved in community and uh, campus activities with my um, brown and black friends, um, I realized that I wasn't getting the education I wanted from the majors that were already created for us to choose from. So I chose poli sci because it was there and anticipated as pre-law prerequisite. But I decided to create a major in African American studies. Uh, we had a department I worked as a work study student in the department, so I was reading everything off the shelves while I was working. Um, but I, I wanted more. I wanted to learn more about my background, which I felt I didn't get in primary school, high school. I wanted to understand my place on campus uh, because there were a lot of kids at Penn who felt entitled and came from country club backgrounds, which was not my background. Um, and so I created a major by you know, liberal arts, putting together all the different courses. It got it approved. And I majored in African-American studies because that's where my path, that's what I wanted to know about. That's what I wanted to learn about. And so I did. Um, I went on to law school and um, you know, eventually went through law and became a judge as I had hoped. And you know, by the grace of God, I am where I am today. And I'm very grateful for that. But I say that to, to, to point out that with that experience and with my career doing everything that I did to get me to this place, here I sit today in an opportunity to have my historical interests stirred back up by this wonderful panel of uh, experts and legal scholars sitting before me. And I'm in awe of you and I just appreciate the opportunity to be here on this panel with you. <clears throat> Having said that, I sit here representing the National Consortium on Racial and Ethnic Fairness in the Courts. It's an organization that was formed out of uh, a meeting of representatives from four states, New Jersey, New York, Michigan, and the state of Washington. Where these uh, justices and representatives of their state course task forces at the time that were developed to study the impact of diversity issues, um, discrimination, or to explore if there were any such issues in their various court systems in New York, New Jersey, Michigan, and Washington State. And these four gentlemen and their executive directors uh, got together and were discussing what they were doing in their task force, what they were exploring, what their various chief justices expected from their exploration. 
And it was determined that, you know, there may be other commissions and task force around the country like these four. And so they decided at that time to create an organization, which is still our umbrella organization of task forces, commissions and committees um, that are formed under either the state judiciary jurisdiction or under some other form, sometimes bar associations, sometimes other associations to keep an eye on, explore, study, or just be aware of the impact of disparate treatment amongst uh, minority people in the judiciary. And so from that meeting, we started with four, we now stand at approximately 39 states or areas that are represented within our commission. And we continue through our membership efforts to try to identify all such commissions and committees around this country and our territories and on our tribal nations that have such uh, organizations because there's strength in numbers, there's shared expertise and, and knowledge that we can share to strengthen our judiciaries wherever we are. And that is our purpose. And so why are we on this conference call? We're on this conference call because one of, um, one of our most proactive board members um, that we have comes from your state of North Carolina and that is James Williams. And um, he's attended our conferences and had attended our, conf had attended our conferences for many, many years. And um, through the way he spoke and he, the questions he raised to on panels as he, we said, who is this man? Who is this gentleman who speaks so eloquently and passionately on every issue that we raise in our various conferences? And uh, eventually James came aboard and he is um, one of our uh, board members. And we're so pleased that he extended this opportunity for us to share. And when he shares with us, he brings and he's very provocative. And he brought this idea to us some time ago about supporting the removal of Confederate monuments in judiciaries. And it, we had other issues going on. We have a lot of different op, uh, issues uh, that we discuss and we address. And he continued to press on this. And we said, you know, we need to really take a good look at this and take a look at this initiative, um, not fully understanding at the time, all of the movement that was going on around and surrounding the removal of monuments. Now, as individuals, we're aware of, of what's going on, but some of us in the North are not as tied to certainly all of the movement that's happening in North Carolina, although we're generally aware of what's happening in the news. But one of the things the National Consortium does, and we're proud of this, is that when we have our annual conferences and we choose our locations, we always ensure that our community engagement collaborative efforts take place in that community where we can learn from and address and support any initiatives that go, are going on in that particular city. So for example, several years ago, we went to Cody, Wyoming. Cody, Wyoming, the site of Hearts Mountain uh, Center. Uh, two of our members, our advisory members on that board and we learned through that experience, Hearts Mountain is a National Historic Landmark, which is a site of a Japanese confinement camp, a location where hundreds of Japanese Americans were sent after, during and after World War II as part of the movement, of course, to round up Japanese Americans who were deemed to be at risk or you know, risky persons and put in Hearts Mountain in the middle of Wyoming, somewhere near, you know, away somewhere. So our conference was held in Cody, Wyoming. We had an opportunity to participate in their interactive center and, and learn more about um, the Japanese Americans, what has happened to them since in their history and in their current situation. We went to St. Louis, Missouri um, recently, uh, we're coming up in time, and it was after uh, all of the upset and civil unrest after the killing of Michael Brown in the Ferguson uh, incident. So we had a town hall meeting in Ferguson at the church, which was the site for many of the community uh, organization, organ, uh, organized meetings. And we had a town hall meeting where we had uh, the new chief of police that was brought in after uh, the Ferguson up, uh, uprising, um, community leaders, religious leaders, and we had a very frank discussion or they told us and informed the audience of how Ferguson has moved along from pre-Michael Brown and the killing till now. And of course, we know since that time, there's been a lot of 
a change, some changes in the law with regard to fines and fees and different kinds of court processes. But if we recall then and reflect on what's happening now, a young black boy was killed by police, a major uh, you know, riots in the street, burning of buildings and stores, uprising of the community. And then the question is, well, what happens now? More recently, we were in Minneapolis, Minnesota, just a couple of, couple of years ago, just two years ago. And while they're having our conference, we went, had a special opportunity to go to an art exhibit that was at one of their local art museums. And it was in honor of Philander Castile. And we hear his name recently because now of the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. We hear about Mr. Castile who was killed and we understand, understood then how that upset the community, the protests, the uprising. And so having had that experience, we're certainly very touched as a consortium having just been there, we're very touched um, by what's happening there now because these people who are so hurt still from Philander Castile's killing, again, are now suffering through George Floyd and what's happening with the police department there. And so it is that um, the National Consortium, we, we are in place to support the local um, commissions or task forces that are in place uh, to support their efforts to provide to support, technical support and initiatives that may be going on in their various communities, participating in town hall meetings and lending our support. And that brings us to where we are today. Um, again, thanks to James Williams for bringing this to our attention. Um, and even as this uh, panel is being presented, we were drafting a resolution, which I'd like to read. Um, and this is hot off the press. So I'm announcing and reading our resolution today, which will be issued broadly uh, after tomorrow to the various sources, the bar associations, uh, the uh, Conference of Chief Justices out of the National Center for State Courts and for various um, publicity. And it reads as follows. Resolution of the National Consortium on Eth Racial and Ethnic Fairness in the Courts. Resolution on the removal of Confederate monuments from judiciary spaces. Whereas the National Consortium on Racial and Ethnic Fairness in the Courts was established in 1988 to support the efforts of state courts around the country to promote a court system that is fair to all and free of racial and ethnic bias. And whereas the National Consortium membership is comprised of state and tribal court task forces, commissions, and individuals advocating for impartial and fair treatment of all court users, regardless of race or ethnicity. And these members and the National Consortium Board of Directors are dedicated to finding evidence-based remedies to redress racial and ethnic disparities in the justice system. And whereas the National Consortium supports proponents who advocate for the removal of Confederate monuments from courthouses and judiciary operated facilities. These tributes were erected to honor Confederate soldiers, officers, and leaders who defended state rights and an economic system in the South that relied on the enslavement and exploitation of black people. As such, the Confederate monuments demonstrative reminders of racism and white supremacy, celebrate a historical political ideology of racial segregation and oppression, which the National Consortium deems unacceptable and reprehensible. And whereas such markers and symbols of inhumanity positioned outside courthouses and centers of government power are a constant reminder of prejudice, hate and racism against black and brown people and therefore are inherently incompatible with the judiciary that should be dedicated to the constitutional assurance of justice and equality under the law. And whereas the people of color have expressed outrage and offense at having to pass these memorials, and I will change this now to monuments before it goes to press, to pass these monuments as they enter courthouses in their communities to obtain services as court users or to perform their civic duty on a jury and thereby are confronted with the duplicitous public message that tends to both invite the public into the halls of justice, but at the same time intimidate and discourage some from the rightful entitlement to full access and fair treatment in the judicial system. And where public 
demonstrations denouncing the continued presence of racist Confederate monuments in judiciary spaces constitutes legitimate public concern. And consequently, the National Consortium implores the judiciary and governments to exercise its authority to take such action as necessary to enhance the public's trust and confidence in the judiciary and to preserve the constitutional rights of all people to equal justice, equal access and justice under the law. Now, therefore, the National Consortium on Racial and Ethnic Fairness in the Courts on this 14th day of July, 2020, calls upon the leaders of the highest courts in each state, tribal nation and territory and related commissions and task force to one, review and catalog all Confederate monuments and markers displayed at courthouses and judicial offices within their jurisdiction and document the history of those monuments and two, take action necessary, take action resulting in the immediate removal of all Confederate monuments, memorials, flags, plaques, and other symbols and markers of racism and white supremacy from all public spaces on, around, or within all property upon which courthouses or judicial offices of any kind are erected. Signed this date, the Honorable Susan F. Maven, President and Moderator, and H. Clifton Grandy Esquire, Secretary, Treasurer, and Coordinator. That is the statement with some modifications from what I've learned today that I will, we will issue um, following our board meeting tomorrow. And uh, we just feel it's extremely important to, to support the efforts of your, your various uh, state and legal uh, advocates in North Carolina and in other states that are doing the same. And we certainly hope that this statement will help you further in those efforts in any of the remaining jurisdictions that still have these monuments in place. Thank you, Judge Maven. And, and that resolution ties together so much of what our presenters have talked about today in terms of um, the hesitancy of people to um, see courthouses as, as a safe, fair place for them um, and the recognition of that and uh, not revising the history. So speaking truthfully about the purposes behind the, the Confederate statues. So um, thank you so much for sharing that and for all of your hard work and being a model to not just the judiciary in your state, but the judiciary throughout this country. We need more and more judges and judicial institutions to follow your lead. Um, we have about 10 minutes left and I want to make sure we get to uh, some of these questions. There were a couple that spoke to um, education in our school system. So Richard Gordon posted a question. He's one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, his question is, the revisionist version of the Civil War has been successfully integrated into our national education system. How do we correct this? Um, Esther Coleman has a related question. Shouldn't the real history be included in K through 12 textbooks in North Carolina? My daughter's social study textbook said uh, the slaves were happy. Um, this is a true quote. So, um, Professor Sturkey, why don't we start with you and then we can have uh, anyone else kind of jump in in terms of how can we do a better job of really educating, particularly the young people. Thanks. I, um, you know, I'm actually pretty optimistic about this. I think some one thing that, that we've got to realize is these people had such a big head start on us, right? And so, I mean, any Jim Crow really ended 1964, 1965, sometime in the late 1960s. So, I mean, I'm the first generation of my family born outside of that era. It's still, and you know, I'm trying to claim my youth here, but it's, it's still pretty relatively new. And so we still have people 10 years ago that went to Jim Crow segregated schools who were still teaching in our schools today. And so I think one of the things that we've seen in the last five years is that the public has become very much more aware of these issues over Confederate monuments, it's a nuanced discussion. You know, it's harder to make this point than it is to make the point, well, no, they're just there to honor the soldiers. So I think that we are getting more of a sense of this nuance and that there are more teachers who are undergoing training that helps them better teach the history of race in this country. And I think, you know, I hate to say this, but it's just gonna take some time for many people 
but I think there also are people that are doing a much better job right now. We have more people from EJI in Montgomery to Teaching Hard History with the Southern Poverty Law Center. There are more places for people to turn to to learn these histories. Great, thank you for that. Any other thoughts on, on education and teaching the real history, not revisionist history? All right, well, let's see. We've got some other questions here. Um, so this is a question, um, Professor Sturkey, I think you're probably best to answer this as well. Were there any oppositions to the um, placement of the monuments or, or putting the monuments up at the time? So of course, there's a lot of opposition now, but at the time when they were being placed, was there opposition or were they yeah. kind of done in the dead of night? <laughs> Well, it, they weren't done in, in the dead of night, but there was always opposition, but it always came from the outside. These are the same places where African Americans were not chronicled in local newspapers. You know, literally black and white were segregated in the press. They didn't cover the activities of African Americans, and they certainly didn't include their voices. You know, a black person in a small southern town couldn't have written an op-ed that they would have ran in the newspaper. 99% of the places in the South. And so their voices were suppressed. So it, it is a little harder to track some of the people that might have dissented. And then of course, there's the fact that why in God's name would you speak out publicly when you know these people just lynched somebody three years ago down the street? So I mean, they had a lot of reasons to be afraid. I mean, physically, sure, but then also the economic consequences um, that might be meted out if you voiced any, any concern over the monument. Thank you for that. Let's see, we've got a couple of other. So we've got some questions related to uh, testing. Um, if we, you know, that the teachers will teach what will be tested and what they're required to. And so that kind of speaks to our discussion of education. But speaking of education, Judge Maven, you mentioned that, you know, being a judge in the in the North, uh, while you may have been, um, sorry about that, while you may have been, you know, you're aware kind of generally, but but the awareness that we have here in North Carolina about these monuments, and, and North Carolina has more monuments, Confederate monuments than most states. Um, what advice would you give to folks who are outside of the South um, and particularly folks with influence that can change the discussion? What advice would you give to them? Well, one of the other passions I have that's been inflamed um, by uh, a lot of the civil unrest that's going on now um, relates to um, many people who are saying this is a different kind of movement. Things are different now. Things are really going to happen. It's different. And I think what sparks that is that because there are so many much, much more younger people involved, there are people of all different hues and backgrounds are involved. And that's all wonderful. But the one thing I say it's so important is that young people have to understand the history and the context of this particular movement. Because as we who are a few years older know, that yeah, everything is cyclical and we've had these movements before and we know that uh, they weren't born in the 60s they weren't born in the 70s the 80s but we know since so pivotal newsworthy incidents that occurred uh, over the decades uh, that shows that a lot of this is cyclical so a lot of older people are a little bit more frustrated but perhaps more motivated to see some change and so to your point with education it's so important that younger people and everybody become educated about the issues uh, that are arising now, whether it's police brutality or whether it's the monuments or whatever it is, education is key. And not just accept what people are saying. There are a lot of webinars, we're a webinar, there's a lot of education, a lot of people talking, but use that as an opportunity for everyone to dig in a little bit further, a little bit deeper to, to learn more about history. And that's why history is so important because it teaches you and it makes you aware of what's going on. So uh, same way I had to dig in when I was in college to find out and educate myself then because I had that natural curiosity. These young people and, and all people who are, you know, championing certain issues that are arising today um, can certainly 
be stronger or buttressed or have a stronger foundation in their arguments if they make sure that they're educated and learned on those issues. As it regards to school, um, I know that there are certain requirements in every state that certain kids, you know, the children pass certain levels of education. Um, but I think it's incumbent upon us to also use this movement, the educators, to advocate for, or the commissioners of education of their various states to advocate for appropriate, balanced, and um, more uh, learned education, particularly in light of what we're, what we're going through now. So it's an opportunity for educators who to get inflamed and ignite their passion for historians or histor uh, history professors to advocate and become involved in various school levels, whether it's your local school board or your state uh, education commission. Now is the time. If there's ever going to be a movement to change history or change those uh, education books and, and the history books, now is the time, just like it's the time for everything else that's happening now. So I would encourage educators uh, to take action now. Strike while the iron is hot, while people are interested in learning. Now is the time to correct those history books or whatever is posted online or wherever, however kids get their education these days, uh, to fix it and take the opportunity to do so now. And I'm not an educator, but that's just my passion coming out. All right. Well, that, that was excellent. We, we only have a few minutes left. And uh, I know Stephen has a couple of things that he wants to, to share, but we just want to thank you all. Oh, no, you don't? Okay. All right. Well, um, well, why don't we do this? In our last few minutes, we will let our yes. uh, panelists go ahead and maybe share about, you know, 30 seconds, last words that you want to share and you want to leave our wonderful attendees with. And um, Attorney Davenport, why don't we start with you? And you're muted. Attorney Davenport, you're still muted. Attorney Davenport, okay. Oh, you're muted again. You're muted again. Matthew? Okay, you can, can you start. No, we could not. Okay. All right, so every year I'm thinking more and more, my wife would prefer that I'd be muted, um, uh, about history and education and um, especially African-American history. We have really done a, a horrible job with whitewashing and sanitizing uh, our history when it comes uh, not just to slavery, but all of Jim Crow and everything that's happened since is, and also the civil rights movement. Now, the way I was taught the civil rights movement and, and the way many are is this sanitized version of uh, comforting quotes from Dr. King and things getting better magically. And we, we, I was never taught not just about freedom riders, but I was never taught about the Tulsa race massacre. I was never taught here in North Carolina about the Wilmington race massacre, the coup d'etat uh, that happened. Uh, and. And I also never heard about, you know, the accomplishments of things like the Harlem Renaissance and things that, you know, my children are fortunately learning about. So things are better today. But, you know, we don't sanitize the Holocaust. We don't sanitize World War II and the violence that occurred there. Uh, but for some reason, we really want the comfort food of whitewash sanit uh, sanitization of uh, the lynchings and the awful history since our original sin of slavery. And that's what needs to get fixed in our education system. It all goes local. It's the local school boards and what they are going to approve for textbooks and what our teachers are going to teach. Um, and I've been encouraged by my sons coming home uh, in the, the young age of first, second, and third grade to, to teach me about people I did not know uh, from African American history and civil rights movement that I never learned the the arc is still moving upward. We just need to keep fighting for it. Great, thank you for that. Um, Professor Holmes? Well, one final thought I have is that the, uh, one importance of these Confederate monuments right now is that they are a, a site of protest in the current movement, the way lunch counters may have were, similar to the way lunch counters were and, and public transportation were in the civil rights movement. So. This is where folks, anti-racists, are gathering to confront people who are overtly racist, to reclaim and claim 
you know, equality. And so the, the protests that are happening around the monument are not just about the monuments. They're about trying to challenge white supremacy as it exists broadly speaking. And, and, and also, they're, 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 because they're in front of courthouses, they're simultaneously about the criminal justice system and mass incarceration and racism and policing. And all that's happening in, in a courthouse near you if you're in the South. And so my, I have um, great respect and admiration for the folks who are, who are you know, putting their own selves at risk to voice in their protest and make, lift up these issues particularly in this time of a pandemic. I'm just grateful that there are folks willing to do that. And these monuments are more than just a site of historical resistance. They are now where folks are, are working out our racial identity as we speak. Great, thank you. Professor Sturkey? You know, I am a historian. I've dedicated my life to studying the past and um, I come to one unimpeachable conclusion, and that is that we owe the future far more than we do the past. We are at a moment where this, where this nation, where this region has another opportunity to make a great leap forward in terms of race. Um, and I think that people should operate with this sense of urgency about what does this mean for the generations that follow? We have a really great opportunity to give them a better world than the one that we inherited, just as people gave us a better world than the one that they had decades and decades ago. And I think, um, I think it's a really promising moment. I'm actually pretty optimistic. Excellent. And Judge Maven, we're gonna let you close us out with your wisdom. Well, I just want, I just think that we've, we've said a lot, I've said a lot. Um, I think my position is clear that if I had all the time in the world, um, I would just continue to work uh, furthering and taking opportunity of all we could do right now while we're in this momentum. And so I share Professor uh, Sturkey's comment that there is a sense of urgency. And um, for people who are not involved, as was stated earlier, if you're not doing pro bono work, if, if you're an attorney who just goes to work and goes home, then, then you're missing out on opportunity to enrich your life by becoming involved in some way, shape or form in this very large movement that we're going on. There's room in this movement for everyone who has a passion for some part of it, whether it's education, whether it's police reform, whether it's uh, any, any portion, just so much can happen. There are people who are recognizing the economic disparities amongst people. And so food banks need help, job opportunities, uh, reemployment strategies, uh, just so much can happen uh, to help balance and, and put us all on a better footing. So. I would just encourage everyone to look deep into your heart, give to your brother, give to your sister, give to your neighbor, give of yourself and join the movement. That's what I would say. Thank you. April, I didn't, I didn't want to take a valuable panelist time, but I would like to thank you all for being here today on behalf of NC Cred and for all the amazing work that you guys do. Um, I really appreciate it. appreciate April and, and all the panelists taking time to be here and sharing their thoughts. I thought this was excellent, very, very informative. And uh, so, yeah, just visit our website, uh, learn more about uh, future events. And I would just say, be well, stay safe. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Take care.